Well, it was Lincoln who created the Thanksgiving holiday we all know and love today. You might be surprised to learn it was originally a day of fasting and prayer. In fact, it has transformed completely over time in many ways I won't go into. Suffice to say, each successive history book has told more and more elaborate lies, all fitting the political narrative of their time, but based wholly on fantasy. In the modern world, many things have been transformed by lies into nonsense, such as governmental nutritional advice. Thankfully, with a little knowledge and less effort than you might think, you can transform your health in a positive manner. I cannot be this thing you want me to be, you know? You're always trying to mold me eh, into the shape of something. You cannot make milk into cheese. Yes, you can. Bad example. First off, what is metabolism? While people often bring up some nonsense about hormones, on a real and literal level, it is entirely based on your mitochondria. That should not be a shocking revelation, since they are both the powerhouse of the cell and the batteries of the cell. But you'll seldom hear it mentioned in these discussions. You'll often hear thyroid hormone mentioned, but this has nothing to do with your metabolism. In fact, it has a markedly negative effect on your metabolism because it is highly catabolic. No hormone in the whole body is more catabolic than thyroid hormone, meaning it burns lots of lean tissue. Not even the dreaded cortisol so many people worry about. At least cortisol is safe during a fasted state because it can then create energy from fat instead of lean tissue. But thyroid hormone is always quite destructive. Thankfully, lowering your insulin levels will reduce your chronic cortisol levels over time, and it will also naturally bring your thyroid levels to healthy, safe levels, regardless of whether they're high or low. Lowering your carbs will also help a great deal. Every time your insulin spikes high from a carb-rich meal, cortisol spikes in response to create more sugar, and cortisol also drives your hunger. This is how carbs can fuel binging and why they are so incredibly addictive. This catabolic anabolic yo-yo is also a large part of why we get thyroid disease. So is gut dysbiosis which is caused mainly by a high carb diet, especially processed carbs. Remember all autoimmune conditions start in the gut. I know that they're tempting. But you might want to think twice before indulging in a side of biscuits with your eggs and bacon. Why don't you stay a while? Put away those fiery biscuits. Fasting helps increase your mitochondrial health and stimulates the growth of new mitochondria. But ultimately your lean tissue will dictate how many mitochondria you have and thus your basal metabolic rate. Happily, fasting also increases your lean tissue over time. In a six-month experiment with alternate day fasting, participants doing ADF not only lost about 10 pounds of pure fat, but also put on lean tissue, even though they didn't change their daily exercise habits at all or change what they were eating. This is because fasting releases growth hormone, which not only replaces any cells lost during a fast, but also regenerates your organs. Your organs tend to shrink over time as you age, but fasting can reverse this. And your organs like the liver and kidneys and heart are just chock full of mitochondria. So is your brain for that matter, which has more mitochondria per cell than any organ in the body. Fasting can actually help you grow new neurons in the brain new brain cells that is, by stimulating stem cell release and also increasing BDNF and NGNF which are hormones that increase the growth of cells in the brain. Ironically, this is a much more long-term study than any hypertrophy studies done in exercise science. So if some bro scientist like Lane Norton tries to tell you fasting will make you lose muscle because of some nonsense study that lasts a week or two, just realize that fasting has long-term data, whereas all the speculative nonsense they talk about in exercise science 
comes from six to eight week studies at most, and many of them are only two or three weeks. A lot of the studies that Lane points to are only one week long, and trying to hold these studies up against six month long data is nothing less than fraud in my opinion. People like Norton and Abby Sharp also look at one week or two week studies in order to promote high carb diets. And of course they also look at isocaloric studies, but people who eat low carbs invariably end up eating fewer calories. And that's part of the whole point of eating low carb in the first place. Not only that, they also burn more calories because fat burning stimulates the mitochondria while carbs actually destroy them. Much of the success of the low carbohydrate diet is that it is extremely effective for people with large appetites who enjoy eating. And these are the two main reasons why. First, hunger is eliminated. Hunger is not even allowed. Hunger is eliminated because the biochemical changes I will outline momentarily reduce the appetite. Secondly, and this is something that bears emphasis, more weight is lost on low carbohydrate diets than on balanced diets identical in calories. This benefit is called metabolic advantage. And we're going to look at these two phenomena right now. First, we'll look at the hunger aspect. Uh, the guru of fasting is a weight loss system. Dr. Garfield Duncan, back in the 60s, when fasting was in vogue, he described a dramatic decrease in hunger after the second day of a fast. He attributed this to high levels of ketones. In his words, in every case, there was a relationship between hyperketonemia and loss of appetite. In 1963, Walter Lyons Bloom, next slide, Walter, it's not a slide, but anyway, Walter Lyons Bloom and Gordon Azar in Atlanta discovered that the same degree of ketosis could be achieved simply by eating protein and fat containing foods and eliminating carbohydrate. There was no need to fast. Instead of a fast, a meat and salad diet would do the trick. Therefore, carbohydrate restriction will suppress the appetite. Bloom and Azar's paper convinced me to go on the only diet I've ever been on. That was 36 years ago, and I'm still counting, and I'm still on it. But, here's the second point. Is a calorie, is a calorie, is a calorie really true? This axiom that everybody repeats, is it really true? The truly significant breakthrough came from Keckwick and Powan. After a series of animal experiments, including the discovery that rats on a low carbohydrate diet put out a fat mobilizing substance, which when injected into other animals caused an automatic weight loss, they directed their attention to obese humans. Two groundbreaking studies were published in 56. Next. First, they studied 1000 calorie diets, but it was a research study that they had done on rats and this is what they did. There were diets 90% fat, 90% protein, 90% carbohydrate. They wanted to see the effect. 1,000 calories of 90% carbohydrate produced no weight loss. As a matter of fact, there was a slight weight gain. The 90% protein diet produced a weight loss between 3.5 and, and 4 pounds uh, in the week that people followed it. The 90% fat diet did even better. Between 5 and 6 pounds of weight were lost. And uh, that is a dramatic portrayal of how different foods can lead to different amounts of weight loss. Uh, but of course, these were all 1,000 calorie diets, and they wanted to look at diets with sufficient calories not to provide guaranteed weight loss. Next. So, look at this one. Look at this one. For an average of eight days, six subjects were alternated between a 2,000 calorie balanced diet and a 2,600 low carbohydrate diet. The 2,000 calorie balanced diet led to a one pound weight gain, as you see on this uh, slide. Whereas the 2,600 calorie low carbohydrate diet given to this very same subject, it was a crossover study, produced a three pound weight loss in the same amount of time. And Keckwick and Pawan did water balance studies and it wasn't water. The food industry also runs these short studies 
in order to promote removing saturated fat from the diet, but in the research of Ansel Keys himself, which he suppressed, it showed that removing saturated fat from the diet in elderly VA patients increased their mortality rate by over 60%. And this is in a long-term study with data spanning many years, not short-term conjectural studies. So you can just ignore these short studies, which are essentially just fraud. And you should always ignore any study that is merely observational when there's experimental data already available. Unfortunately, fraudsters constantly use these tactics in order to promote invalid positions, and they're handsomely paid to do so by the food and drug industries. In short, you don't have to worry about harming your metabolism in the long term while fasting. This may seem surprising, but your body is designed to fast. Our ancestors lived through a million plus year ice age, arguably two million plus years. And even in the modern era, periodic times of famine have been the norm. In the prehistoric era, every single winter would have been a struggle to survive. In fact, we're better at fasting than virtually any animal on the entire planet. While we can't hibernate, we get into ketosis far more quickly than even a bear can, and we lose less lean tissue when we stop eating than any other animal. In the short term, fasting has an even more amazing effect on metabolism. You might assume that your body immediately slows down the caloric burning during a fast, but it actually does the opposite. Our body increases adrenaline while fasting, which increases the burning of fat and total caloric consumption of the cells. This increases our metabolism by as much as 17% during a fast of 36 to 96 hours. After that, it starts to ebb downwards, and that is part of the reason I tend to encourage a fast length of 36 to 96 hours at a time. This gives you the most bang for the buck. Another point of interest regarding metabolism is that burning saturated fat, especially stearic acid, actually increases the creation of new mitochondria. Stearic acid's most common source is from beef, which is where it gets its name. This is also the largest fat molecule stored in the body, and as such it is the hardest to mobilize in the fat cells, and thus the last to burn. When you fast, you quickly burn through the lighter oils like linoleic acid, and as soon as those are gone, you will burn pure saturated fat. This increases your metabolism because the stearic acid leads to the creation of excess succinate in the energy production cycle within the cell. Hufa is polyunsaturated fat. Um, these are liquid oils. They mostly come from vegetable sources. Um, they have multiple double bonds. Linoleic acid is by far the most common one. Um, corn oil, sunflower oil, soybean oil are the main sources of linoleic acid typically, but uh, linoleic acid also accumulates when you feed it to animals. So um, you can get quite a bit of linoleic acid from uh, sources like uh, pork and chicken as well. And then you have saturated fats. These are hard at room temperature. Things like beef tallow, cocoa butter, and coconut oil are some of the most saturated natural fats that we have. Um, beef tallow can be up and, and Cocoa butter can be up to like two thirds saturated and coconut oil can be as high as 90% uh, saturated or more. As if you take an American um, squirrel who is uh, foraging donuts and fried chicken out of a dumpster uh, versus a French squirrel who is foraging behind a patisserie uh, and is eating butter croissant out of the dumpster um and then it gets cold winter is oncoming the days are coming shorter you fast them you take the food away what happens is uh the american squirrel who was able to eat enough um linoleic acid is able to lower its metabolic rate and hibernates uh, it goes into torpor and it hibernates the french squirrel uh fails to go into torpor um it totally fails to hibernate and it burns off its entire winter store of fat in nine 
days. Um, and you know, those slides are funny, but this is a real, this is a real experiment that was done. Um, so if you feed the squirrels, uh, if the squirrels were fed one and a half percent linoleic acid, they had 10% linoleic acid in their body fat content. And those are the squirrels that burned off their winter supply of fat in nine days. Uh, if you give them a medium amount of linoleic acid, about 3% in the diet, their body fat builds up to about 18%. Three out of four of those entered torpor, but two of them woke up early and one of them died in mid winter. And so none of them were able to make it through hibernation either. So, so essentially in evolutionary terms, all eight of those squirrels would have died. Um, whereas the squirrels who got 8% of linoleic acid in their diet, they build up to 30% in their body fat and four out of four of those squirrels actually were able to enter torpor and hibernate. So. Um, this polyunsaturated fat, we've been known for a long time, polyunsaturated fat is necessary for a torpid metabolism. Interestingly, this is also how cold therapy works, also known as the Wim Hof method. And this also only works when you shiver. So if you don't shiver, you're not getting any benefits out of it at all. On the other hand, you could just get this through fasting and you can even get it from any activity that shakes your fat cells around, which also releases succinate. This includes vibration boards or simply hopping up and down in place a bit. Since your BMR is based on mitochondria, this is also going to help with metabolism in the long run. So whether you look at the long term or the short term, fasting will ramp up your energy production within the body. It creates new mitochondria, increases adrenaline while fasting to increase fat burning, and it grows new lean tissue, which ultimately is going to do a lot to improve your BMR in the long term, which is proven by experimental data. I've also found that fasting breaks your addictions, especially your addiction to food. Even if you did go ham with your Thanksgiving celebration, a nice 36 to 96 hour fast will help you feel better and keep you from continuing to overindulge. Remember, while eating bad food can be pleasurable, those feelings are always momentary and afterwards you always feel worse. Makes a mockery of humanity the things men will do for those one and a half minutes of pleasure. One and a half minutes? Two minutes, whatever. 